Hello, everyone. It's Monday. Honestly, it doesn't feel like a Monday today for me for some reason. I'm not sure why that is. I had an awesome weekend. Hopefully, you guys had a good one as well. I'm just waiting for a friend to jump on. I see that he just joined, so let's see. We can get him connected and then we will get started. Hello. Hi. I love your background. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. How's did that? You, did you set that specifically up for this live? Uh, honestly, so. <laughs> I think one thing COVID has done for me has been to like force me to find new ways of rearranging this place <laughs> and like changing your own scenery, you know? <laughs> yeah. So. My friends and I always joke about how like for our YouTube videos, we kind of like rearrange the back of our videos so that it looks like we're super clean. Whereas like if you tilted our camera just a little bit over, you'd see like, We've got piles of everything over oh, there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My laundry basket is literally right here, <laughs> so don't let this fool you. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I've got all my, like, paperwork everywhere, so I'll keep you guys facing this direction. Yeah. I became a plant dad recently, so I was just I, showing, yeah. you know, as they do. I think that's that's the uh, one of the, um, like, COVID memes, right? It's, you either become a plant dad or you um, learn how to bake sourdough. <laughs> there's two types of people well i'm a very bad plant dad i've killed quite a few plants in attempts uh yeah. to i think that i was trying to make it look aesthetically pleasing instead of putting them in the right amount of sunlight in my room so yeah i was struggling but i've found some plants that i can keep alive and i'll just keep those and the rest i i apologize to their families for killing yeah. <laughs> awesome uh. Well, I'll let you introduce yourself so the people watching know who you are, and then we can just jump into the discussion. Yeah, my name's Ty Stimpert. I uh, hail from Cleveland, Ohio, where it has just recently turned from summer instantly into gray autumn, unfortunately. Um, and I uh, work in community health. I um have been working community health for about five years and um yeah excited to talk to you and and explore some uh positivity up in here yeah awesome it's so needed <laughs> yes most definitely i feel like social media can be used as an amazing thing but it can also definitely bring a lot of negativity with it as well so you said that you're kind of in community health um uh, since today is the conversation around adapting to the new normal, I feel like that is something that has seen a lot of changes in 2020. How have you kind of been adapting in that field? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think uh, that, I mean, the first week that the shutdown started, we were, you know, of course, immediately uh, canceled everything and shut down. So it's been quite the journey. We actually became like the COVID-19 screeners at the cancer center, making sure that, uh, you know, trying to keep, trying to keep it as safe as possible. But uh, as the uh, months went on, I think we realized this was a good opportunity to sort of reassess, take a step back, you know, we're always go, 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 go. And we were finally able to say, okay, it's 2020. How, how can we think about community health in new ways? And, uh, you know, really be reinventive of the kind of things that we're doing, you know, it gets so old, just like health fairs and, you know, sort of old school ways of thinking of community health. Um, how can we really bring this into it? And of course, it's more relevant than, of, than ever, ever with, um, you know, COVID-19 being a health crisis in itself. So yeah. it, it was uh, quite the journey, but now we're learning to adapt we're uh realizing what kind of extra sa safety measures need to be taken in this kind of 
um, n you know, new reality that we're in. That's definitely, I feel like, so you're on the health side of things. I'm on the telecommu telecommunication side of things. I feel like I'm having trouble with my tongue today, but uh, <laughs> so I, we kind of got hit in a way that we really weren't expecting. Um, we first, the first thing that we got hit with was most of the products that our company uses are shipped from China. So mm -hmm. we kind of noticed a slap in the face with, we weren't getting shipments. So we had goals and things we had to hit and we didn't have supplies. And then we got hit with the bandwidth, couldn't support the amount of people yeah. that were now having to use us for every single line of work out there, whether it's just an office job that's turned virtual and now they're working from home instead of their office where it was equipped for that amount of, uh, Wi-Fi going all at once now like I mean I remember when Zoom crashed on the first day of like most <laughs> yeah, schools, of course. Uh, our company was trying to figure everything out on that side of things so I definitely feel like we've had to adapt quickly uh, I think the health field has most definitely adapted quickly uh, I was actually at the beginning of this pandemic I worked with a company that did like the STI tests and stuff like that because so many people were so fixed on going into the health departments and stuff like that. And a lot of those got shut down um, at the beginning of COVID because yeah, that's true. it was just like we had to stop the spread. And so I was trying to partner with them and get at home tests started and all of that fun stuff. So it's definitely an interesting way. I think that the companies and people with the mindset of, the new normal uh, is are the people that are going to be the ones that are productive and moving forward. Uh, the people who are stuck in the mindset of, I can't wait for things to return to normal. I think that they're going to realize that they're going to have to adapt to the new normal because I don't think it's going back to the way that things used to be. No, I mean, I think in a lot of ways this has changed, um, you know, our perception of reality in a lot of different ways, you know, whether that's um, our view of the healthcare industry in general, or our, our own health, or the way that we interact with each other, you know, there's so many layers to this that I think are going to have ripple effect down the line. One thing I read recently, though, was the, um, the pandemic, actually, uh, it, it hasn't slowed down um, the sort of uh, uh, process of thinking, it's actually sped, sped everything up because now we are using Zoom, we're realizing like how much technology can help us in all these different ways. Whereas before I think it was sort of lackluster in a lot of industries, um, you know, especially throughout the Midwest and, and in places that aren't uh, say Silicon Valley. Yeah. I mean, I live in a very rural area. So when it comes to, I was thankful that I work within a telecommunication company because pretty much everyone's pretty savvy when it comes to the virtual way of doing things. Uh, we cover many, many states. So my team, none of us really live close to each other. So virtual life was already pretty familiar for us. Yeah. So the switch was getting everyone that was customer facing and going out into the world, switching them to as virtual as we could was a very interesting concept. Uh, and I mean, even for us, like my car broke down right at the beginning of this and Ugh. I learned how so many things are infected or impacted by something like this. Because when I was trying to call the insurance company, like they work through a, like a call center, all their call centers are shut down. And so they're operating from people being at home, which doesn't necessarily give everyone the same bandwidth. Um, and right. I got disconnected multiple times. And every <laughs> single day, I seem to be running into a new thing that's being impacted by this. But I think like the mindset that you take with it is really important. I've noticed that, I mean, we've got people who have students that are now You've got parents that are working at home virtually. Their students are, or their children are requiring them to be pretty much their teachers when their virtual teachers aren't sitting there helping them. And I think just everyone in general, uh, 
you really have to go out into the world with a positive mindset and a very understanding, open mind, because I think everyone's very frustrated right now. Uh, whether it's you can't get in touch with the tele, like the people on the call centers or right. teachers are all over the place. I think you just right. have to we have all a have a reason mind. in 2020 to be <laughs> upset or angry or something. It's about um, just recognizing that and moving forward with a positive attitude, you know? Yeah, I think that when it comes to, for me, I've, I've still hung out with friends. I've still found ways to be social. Uh, of course, traveling has been completely knocked off my plate when it came to 2020. Yeah. Uh, but I still have found ways to still be around friends. We've done a lot of outdoor things not excited about winter uh, because that means outdoor things are going to become cold and yeah. that's never fun for me. I'm definitely a summer person. Yeah. Someone recently said to me, um, well, it's winter. When, when you were a kid, you would go outside and play. And I said, yeah, but now I'm an adult and I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, but there's so many winter, there's so many winter sports and activities. I'm like, yeah, but uh, the cold. <laughs> I don't enjoy that part of thing. Yeah, but there's also like sunny beaches, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, I, I do like it. I do like it. I love to ski, so it won't be too bad. But I figure skiing will be pretty safe considering that you're layered up all the time. But who knows? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, most people are already wearing like ski masks and then now right. you've got ski goggles. So I feel like it's almost like we were prepared for that part. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You can't take skiing down. <laughs> they're, they're prepared <laughs> for anything. Yeah, and I mean, you've got gloves on. So when you're on the ski lift and all that stuff, you're set. You're not spreading anything. Yeah, it's got to be the most like germ friendly or I guess anti germ uh, <laughs> activity. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely. So when it comes to because I mean, COVID pretty much hit us at the beginning of the year. How did that kind of affect your summer? Were there things that you kind of had planned for 2020 that you kind of had to shift? Yeah, I mean, I think like everyone, um, <laughs> the plans that were being made were getting pushed back and getting pushed back. And then eventually <laughs> it was, uh, I think this is gonna get pushed back to next year. You know, that, that time span just kept increasing. Um, I really thrive off of travel. It's, um, you know, I love the city of Cleveland so much and it's, it's so inexpensive to live. So I like to counter that with, you know, having experiences um, elsewhere and making sure that I travel and have friends throughout uh, the country and the world really. So uh, it, it hit me, I think really deep when uh, I realized that all all travel plans were going to be going to be canceled. Actually, we planned for uh, a couple trips this summer. One of them was to visit, you know, some of my best friends uh, on the West Coast. And the day before, I get a call, and uh, unfortunately, they tested positive for COVID. So I was like, okay, <laughs> this is obviously a sign. I'm not going yeah. anywhere. Yeah. I, um, I was supposed to go to Italy, so that plan got canceled. I mean, they got hit really hard right before we got hit hard. So right. it was definitely, uh, yep, that's not going to happen this year. Uh, one thing that I've had a lot of people kind of start throwing out to me was just like, we're almost at the end of 2020, as if like January 1st is going to hit and just the world is going to be cleansed of yeah. COVID. <laughs> um, I, I feel like one thing like as a life coach that I always tell people is like stop throwing your happiness stop throwing like your future plans further and further away from yourself like don't sit there and say well when 2021 gets here things are going to be better like it's all about shifting your mindset and adapting to living your best life here uh in this current moment so what are some things that you have been doing to kind of just because I mean you can't stop living life just because there's a pandemic. Right. What are some things that you've been kind of doing to adjust? Yeah, I think um, <laughs> there's things I've been doing to adjust and there's things I've been doing to, you know, stay sane. 
<laughs> yeah, I think um, those are two things that I had to do together uh, to maintain, you know, the balance of, of life, really. So, I mean, first, I made sure that my boredom became productive mm -hmm. to at least a level that I'm comfortable with. I mean, it's okay to be, it's okay to uh, feel stuck at home and like you're not doing anything, but what could you be doing with that time? So I'm trying to like uh, actually meditate and think on that. Like what, what is your outlook on the world and how do you make that uh, a reality, you know? So really just like reminding yourself that wake up the next morning and make the world a better place <laughs> somehow, yeah. some way, you know, um, just make sure that you are keeping in mind that um, tomorrow can always be better. It's a new start every day. I feel like setting intentions each day helps me end that day on uh, a positive note, you know? Yeah, I mean, for me- And then I also picked up some crazy habits. Like I, uh -oh. <laughs> I started making kombucha. My kitchen is full of kombucha now. It's, <laughs> I've become a plant dad, so there's that. Uh, we started gardening, it did not go well, so uh yeah you know, <laughs> just keeping busy whether it's productive or not sometimes <laughs> yeah i mean for me personally like i think that i had to shift my mindset to because there's a lot of things like when life got stressful there's a lot of things that i would do to like de-stress myself like i would go out uh sometimes i would just go to a coffee shop and just sit and do my work there so that i was yes. surrounded by people more than four walls and that kind of got uh, taken out. Uh, shopping was something that I used to do. Uh, not really doing that anymore. Uh, Amazon was dangerous. I did that for a little bit. And I was like, this is too much. This is worse than shopping. I'm spending uh, all my money. Yeah, too <laughs> so, easy. They make it too easy. <laughs> so, I mean, I've, I've limited the amount of people that I've been exposing myself to, but I've still made it to where I was still surrounding myself with friends uh these lives have been phenomenal for me like these have been like the highlight of every single day and yeah. then <laughs> disconnecting from social media uh because right now there's a lot of things that are very negative out there and i mean it's everybody seems to be impacted in a negative way it's not just like there's negative people and then there's positive people right um, but and i think you have that you have that in addition to you know, everyone having this access to social media and being able to express that. So when you have, you know, basically a whole world of people that has, uh, that, that have been affected by this pandemic or, um, you know, the, the uh, racial tension, at least in the US, things like that. I mean, these things are all impacting each one of us. And now we have this device that we've learned to express ourselves freely which can be so good like you mentioned but then um you know then you have everybody having an opinion <laughs> at once and it can be one overwhelming and two can be really contentious in, in in some and many situations yeah i think that a lot of people just have to start like realizing that everyone is allowed and entitled to their own views and opinions of things and just because someone's is different than yours does not mean it's wrong. Um, I've seen a lot of people that just seem to attack each other for having different views instead of uh, asking and trying to understand someone's different perspective. Uh, it seems like everyone's almost used it as a platform to attack each other. Uh, I mean, I'm regular going through my newsfeed and removing comments that people have put on my things that they don't seem to have any idea or want to have like a civil conversation. They just want to throw out a hateful comment and just like condemn someone to hell for yeah. <laughs> having a different view. 
Uh, for me, I've been using it to just kind of educate myself. I mean, I just uploaded a YouTube video today. Um, my sister's boyfriend taught me how to shoot guns uh, two <laughs> weeks ago. And I, him and I have always seen, we were very different in he's very Republican, I'm very Democrat. We, when it comes to gun control, we have very different uh, views. I had never touched a gun. I had never shot one. Um, so he thought that it was necessary that I, when I, it comes to my arguments for why I think there needs to be gun control, he thought that having a better understanding of guns and how they function and all of that uh, would help with my understanding. He thought that it would kind of pull me to his side of things, but it yeah. really just made my argument stronger. And now I have a better understanding of how guns function, uh, the safeties and how it feels to hold a gun. Um, yeah. It made me realize how easy it is to uh, end someone's life because I honestly thought that it was a lot scarier uh, than it is. But now I can see why there's accidents and why mm -hmm. things like that happen. Uh, yeah. But now yeah, I have a better understanding. Yeah, I think the important thing is that uh, you are willing to do it, you know? Exactly. And I think we lost your audio. Let's see. see if we can get him back on here there we go i think okay. when someone calls your phone like it cuts your audio off and then it doesn't let you oh <laughs> okay okay no <Noted>. but <laughs> um yeah but i was just saying even if at the end of the day all it did was make your argument stronger you were still open to that um you know experience in that that perspective yeah. And I mean, when it comes to where I live, like there are a lot of people who have very, very different views than my own. Mm -hmm. And I'm always the type of person that I'm very interested in understanding why they're different, because I think that I'm forever learning. And I am aware that my perspective and my views come from the situations and environment that I live in. So for me, like, I just took that as an opportunity to learn something new. And it was definitely a new experience. It's not something that I would do all the time, but I mean, it's not something that I'm just like, oh, why would you sit around and shoot guns all day? Like he was in the Marines, so I felt very safe and I didn't feel like, um, I felt like I learned a lot. He had a lot of information to give me. So I think a lot of people just need to take those types of opportunities in 2020 and like going forward. I think it's like really cool to learn new perspectives and a better understanding of things. Yeah, you know, there was, um, I think he's the uh, head of uh, Vox, the news company. And he wrote a book, his name's Ezra Klein, it's called Why We're Polarized. And I, I recently uh, finished it, it took me a while because I realized it was sort of parallel to what's happening now. And it was very almost too relevant in a lot of ways. So I, you know, had to put it down. It was a little heavy for me at some points, um, just because of the reality we live in. And uh, I, I found it really interesting how he talks about the way that uh, specifically American culture has, you know, cultivated these sects of people that, um, or, or ways of thinking almost, that have become very of course, polarized, but also unwilling to listen to the other side and how that is then harnessed by, uh, you know, media or um, pop culture or whatever it may be, it harnesses that sort of uh, grouping or, or separation of people into these factions. Um, so it, it was a really interesting read. I, I suggest it to anyone listening. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll definitely have to check that one out. I have not. Uh, but yeah, I, when it came to my reading here in 2020, I've escaped into a lot of fictional books because when you're reading, when you're dealing with it on the outside world and then you're at home and you're reading about it, it can get really stressful. Uh, I started watching House of Cards, which 
I felt like that was very, very relevant to what's going on in the <laughs> real world. And I was just like, I need something a little bit more happy and lighthearted You're to bring right. back out. <laughs> but yeah, I definitely agree that when it comes to the polarized world that we live in, I think that places like the media, um, anyone can really take advantage of that type of environment. Because, I mean, if you think about it, all you have to do is say something that one side will agree with and one side won't. And you can cause any type of movement to happen, uh, whether it's positive or negative. I think that it can be taken both ways. Yeah, I agree. So when it comes to adapting to a new normal, I feel like now that we're all kind of on social media, I think that when it comes to the way that we communicate, the way that we like navigate through the world, it's very virtual. And I feel like human beings were not really meant to connect that way. I feel like people are meant to be physically around each other. And I feel like even when you think about like when we were younger and in high school, um, before like social media was huge, like it is right. now, I feel like the world was a lot more kinder. I feel like it was if I think that people feel like they can be a lot more mean online than they are. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things that I'm seeing a lot more of now is because we're becoming more and more disconnected, especially with social distancing to where I think that people, I mean, my channel and my platforms have been getting trolled a lot more than normal. Mm. Uh, so I've been trying to battle it with stuff like this. Uh, what are some things that you've kind of been adapting to? Cause I mean, that's definitely not the direction we want the new normal to go. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. You know, this kind of goes back to what I said earlier, as far as people, having a platform to express themselves, sometimes not taking a beat and like understanding that feeling or that anger or that, uh, you know, what, whatever it might be, uh, rather than expressing it or feeling it, they, they go straight to their phone. And now, you know, we're looking at our phones more often than ever because one, we are not in a normal routine. Two, we, uh, are consuming so much new news. And if we're not consuming news, we're consuming other media. So it's like consumption, consumption, consumption. And we regurgitate it, you, you know, just as fast with our own views and disagreements, especially people love to disagree or tell you why you're wrong. And I think that is something that we um, see so much more prevalent when you don't have to say it to someone's face you know it's like i actually equate it to like being in grade school and like writing notes about each other like you're writing mean notes and you're passing it around and it's about the show of it it's about like you wanting to express your opinion and and not hold back or just make somebody feel bad people love making people feel bad it's it's unfortunate, but uh, that's how that's how some people operate. So um, I think combating that with uh, using social media in a positive way and connecting with people, I think is so important. And also like detoxing from it a little or, uh, you know, limiting how much screen time or how much news you consume. I know I've done that multiple times this summer, <laughs> you know, um, I've become a huge news junkie and a huge um, person who loves to read about these different things. And sometimes it gets way too much because like my boyfriend loves reading fiction, like you mentioned, and to kind of escape from that. But I'm over here like, no, no, I need to know more about this topic. I need to like, re I, I read a book on consciousness this summer. I read it like I am just like finding topics that, I, that interest me or that I, I hear about. And I'm just like zoning in and like reading things about it. Um, but it gets so heavy sometimes, you know, because you're not only living in this world, but then you're also exploring kind of deeply um, rooted contextual things about it, um, about the world that we live in. So it, it can be too much. And then on top of that, you're dealing with crazy political uh, and news cycles just 24 seven. 
So it can be so heavy on you. So I think it's so important to say, it's okay, you can put your phone down. You know, we can uh, sit and, you know, talk face to face around those that, you know, are in our circle right now due to COVID. Um, but I, I think detoxing from social media and not, you know, actively, actively checking in when your social media, you know, bell is ringing like, oh, you should check that notification, you should check that notification. Um, and learning like, it's okay, not that important. You know? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I really taking that beat. Yeah, I moved all my social media apps to a folder on the last page of my screen, mm -hmm. so that my brain would physically think before I do it because it was getting to the point where like, I was just tapping it out of boredom out of habit. And so I had to physically move it to where my brain was like, you're about to do it again. And I would stop myself because I was looking at the hours because now the Apple phones tell us how many hours we've spent on our phones. Uh -huh. And I was embarrassed by the amount of hours yeah. that I had spent. So I was just like, okay, I have to detach from this. And you were talking about how things are like very polarized and political and all of that fun stuff. I've, I've been telling people that every single time that they see someone who has a different view than their own, who maybe posts something that's very hateful towards the opposite side of things is to reach out to that person and have a conversation not based around politics and find something positive to speak to that person about before you comment underneath of it and put whatever, whatever views you have underneath there. Because a lot of people, I feel like they see a Trump post and they instantly start attacking what they think about Trump, either what they think about their supporters or why Biden's better. What, and it's the flip side, too. It's the exact same thing. And I told them that it's better to have that conversation outside of that context, because then you start to realize you're speaking to a human being with a family, with a job, maybe not a job right now because of COVID. And when you start having those conversations and turning people back into humans instead of little robots on the internet and mm -hmm. little pictures on a screen that you really start. Cause I mean, I've right now scrolling through Facebook. I noticed that a lot of people's pictures are either like it says Biden on it, or it says Trump, which instantly infuriates any one of the opposite sides. Mm -hmm. And they start talking to each other in ways that they would never do face to face. They would never disrespect each other on that level. And mm -hmm. I think that people need to stop thinking of ways to divide us and find ways to pull us back together. Because honestly, no matter who gets elected on November 3rd this year, our country is still very divided. And we have to find ways to pull it back together because no matter who gets elected, it's not solving the problem that we have in this country. The pandemic is still going to exist. Um, the division is still going to exist. There's still going to be red, blue. There's still going to be black, white. There's like all of this is still going to exist. Like people once again keep saying, well, after November 3rd, I'm like, it's not going to fix anything. It's more like after a football game, you get the bragging rights of winning, but it doesn't solve any of the problems that we've got going on. And yeah. I've been trying to get people to realize that I was like, how about instead of saying why you hate the opposite party, post something about what you like about your current party, like really boost that person up and really practice doing that. Like go online and instead of seeking out people who think differently, go and cheer someone on for posting like a positive thing about their candidate. Like it's, it's so easy to make that type of flip and it would start encouraging better behaviors online. And I just like, I had a Biden hoodie on the other day and I had someone with a Trump shirt come up and give me a fist pump. And he was like, uh, good job. He's like, I respect you. Uh -huh. and we didn't have the conversation of which president we were voting for. It was just, yeah. it was a positive fist pump. I don't, I'm not the type of person I'm like, well, you hate gay people cause you're wearing that shirt. I mean, if I had known that person, I would have had a conversation. But in that moment, it wasn't a negative thing. And I didn't leave like thinking about that moment in a negative way. Yeah, I think this 
election in particular, even more than the last, um, has created this divisive uh, aura, <laughs> if you will, in this in this country. And I think that that is much bigger than the candidates. But um, at the same time, these candidates are representative of, uh, you know, I, I think divisiveness versus unity. And uh, even, I, I don't know, I, I think that that is so important um, to mention because there, I 100% agree that the divisiveness is the issue but I just hope that people see, you know, that uh, there is one candidate who is only sowing more chaos within that divisiveness. And whether it's on purpose or it's, uh, you know, um, just actually how he uh, feels and communicates, um, it, I think it's problematic for like the country as a whole and the, you know our government uh leadership worldwide yeah i mean it really does start at the top and if that kind of chaos and divisiveness is seen and accepted and even promoted in a lot of ways uh then that's it <laughs> i mean i think that the issue is that there's a lot of people out there who no matter who gets elected, it won't affect them. And I think mm -hmm. in that mindset, it's really hard to get those types of people to understand what the difference is between Biden winning um, in the next four years and Trump winning again. I think that at that point, we do have to educate people. And I think that the, like you were saying earlier, having those two polarized sides can be used to our disadvantage and it's being used to our disadvantage because Trump by is really sides, good by Trump is really know. good at getting his side to believe everything that he says to where they are so far over there that no matter what we scream on this side it's not going to be heard and like you were saying like you can use that to your advantage which mm -hmm. Trump is doing full like and someone said in the com last election was unknown. Now we know, like, I, I think that there was a lot of people out there that didn't think it was even possible that Trump could win, which caused a lot of people not to vote. Uh, living where I do, all I saw was Trump signs. So mm -hmm. I was encouraging every person in the world to vote. <laughs> so I was just like, if you don't live in this country, you better be freaking messaging every person that you know le that lives in this country and telling them they need to vote because yes. <laughs> the person who's the president of the United States affects the world. It's not just us. We're the ones who get to vote. Yeah. Uh, but the relationships around the world are being impacted by who's sitting in that seat. Yeah, I and totally agree. And I mean, we're <laughs> electing two of the oldest presidential candidates or we're, we're voting on two of the oldest presidential candidates, which is, I mean, getting to be a little old for me, I think uh, the percentage of younger Americans in the country versus uh, baby boomers and older Americans is, is uh, you know, skewing so, we're skewing so younger now as a nation and that's not reflected in our politics. So that's one thing he mentions in the book actually is that sort of generational divide and how this, uh, really generation of leaders never stepped down and we haven't been honing, you know, a lot of young leadership or they haven't been given the platform or the, uh, you know, the place in, in government or in decision making. And so I think we need to start figuring out how to integrate these younger generations, including ours, um, into politics and decision making because I think that's why people are so fired up. It's like, I think government is very representative of uh, an older sect of the population, which obviously should be represented, but it's so, um, it, it's so uneven as to what the actual country looks like. Yeah. 
I mean, I think I definitely think that when it comes to politics, like it's definitely starting to be apparent that the younger generations are paying a lot more attention to it, whether it's the TikTok uh, generation where they're really like, I'm seeing a lot of political things. Um, and I'm actually very impressed with the younger generation's um, involvement, even the ones that are too young to vote are yeah. still <laughs> trying to make a stand, uh, whether it comes to influence or like, I mean, even the educating of our parents to help them understand like, hey, this is what's at risk. Hey, this is what LGBTQIA plus stands for. These are the people being impacted. I mean, I've personally, like when it came to like the Black Lives Matter movement, I've had discussions with my grandmother. I've had it with my dad, my mom. And because it's their generation, that's kind of, I felt like very lazy on that aspect, at least on the white privileged side of things. Whereas I feel like the newer generations, the white privilege um, is being recognized now and it's kind of being pushed down, which is what needs to happen. I've told a lot of people, I feel like when it comes to that movement, it's not racism that's the problem, it's the white privilege because the white privilege makes you think that racism doesn't exist if you are nice to people of minority groups. You're not racist if you just live your life and don't do anything. And it's like, no, your white privilege sets you above everyone else. And if you don't acknowledge that, if you don't accept that you've been handed things in life because you're white, then we've still got a huge problem in this country. That, and that's exactly that... it. it. It's such, I mean, I think it's such a huge ego. Um, it, it's such a huge ego problem, really. I, they say that racism is a white person's problem. And I think that's 100% true because it is 100% the ego of uh, white America. You know, it's the concept that, well, that's in the past and it's over and I wasn't a part of it. So, you know, it doesn't affect me. But by saying that you are actually disregarding the fact that uh, so many other Americans that don't look like you and, uh, you know, don't look like you or I, uh, really, they are so affected in the, from the smallest ways to the most brutal violent ways as we, you know, specifically have uh, come to see this past summer so much. Um, I, I mean, for years, really, unfortunately. Um, but I think the white allyship is so important for the Black Lives Matter movement um, because it is not, you know, <laughs> no black people are thinking that racism or, or brown or people of color at all are thinking that racism is their problem. It's a problem that's affecting them and it's caused by, uh, you know, the, the white America. Yeah. I mean, like we were talking about earlier, when it comes to polarized, uh, we have to start to work together and come up with ways to come up with a voice, come up with something that people can hear. Because I, I've said this in another live where I, my old roommate, she used to say that I had white privilege, like earplugs in, and I couldn't mm. hear certain things. And it was true. And the way that she approached me about it uh, did not help me pull those plugs out. It was later on when I had another friend that spoke to me on a level where she related it to my own struggle for equality for the LGBT community, where she was like, hey, here's what it's like. Here's some similarities to what you're experiencing. Here's what I'm experiencing. Here's the bigger picture. Like it took someone saying, here's who I'm talking to. How do I get him to hear? Because the problem is people think that if you scream it loud enough, eventually they're going to hear. Mm -hmm. And the problem is it's not true. Like people talk about like the Love, Simon movie and they're like, oh, it's such a big like movement. And like, it's doing so much for the LGBT. I'm like, nope, because the people that hated us before aren't going to watch that anyway. Uh, right. Just like people who watch Fox News are not going to switch over to CNN. 
Uh, right. We have to create and craft a message that will open people's ears. And I think that we have to work together as a community of everyone with a billion different backgrounds, a diff different perspectives from a thousand different places because it's in, like racism, white privilege, it infects every like every piece of structure in the world. Like it doesn't matter where you look, it exists. And you can't fight it from just one angle. It has to be fought from every single angle possible. Yeah, I mean, I uh, specifically the the health, you know, um, area that I, I work in is cancer. So it's about cancer prevention and screening and, uh, you know, what um, the disparities exist in different population groups. And unfortunately, I mean, LGBT is definitely, uh, you know, part of the disparities that I work on. But uh, the biggest disparities are always um, racial and ethnic minorities. And you have to wonder why. These are uh, often like minority stress caused um, issues or barriers that exist. And that is simply unfair. You know, there was a, another thing I wanted to mention. There was a, <laughs> a PSA by um, the Barbie Instagram. <laughs> and it was like the just these two Barbies having a like real discussion maybe it was three minutes long or something about the Black Lives Matter movement and why it's important and it was such just like a simplified uh you know beautiful version of I mean not beautiful maybe but uh but simplified like um easy to grasp understanding of what it is and why white privilege or, or how white privilege exists um, and how recognizing that is so important to uh, achieving any kind of equality or equity or health equity. That's at least the first step that we can do is admit that there's racism and work towards anti-racism. Yeah, and I mean, I think that that's something like you have to look at it from all different angles, like a message that might really touch you might not be something that touches another person's heart when it comes to th different things. It's all about understanding the people that are around you. And I've said it before, like we each will play a role in someone else's life. We won't necessarily play a role in changing every person's mind because when it comes to like, the white straight male like i don't really have any influence with them i don't have a lot in common with them but there are some that i do have relationships with whether they are co-workers whether they are uh people that my sister has dated uh there's small connections that we can make to help make a bigger change and i think that when it comes to how divided we are becoming we're becoming so polarized and so divided that it's getting to a dangerous point where we're losing all of our connections to make positive change. And I mean, you see it with the LGBT stuff in the more rural areas where people are just moving to the big city because it's safer there. They're not having those conversations. And it's something that people, it's, it's okay to be vocal on social media, but it's almost like people are screaming to the choir that's already singing the same song and it's not making any change and it's not changing anything for the better and people act like they're doing something good and i'm like okay you screaming that gays should have rights to all your gay friends i'm pretty sure they agree with you there <laughs> um how about you have a conversation with uh maybe your parents that are really it's hard to do like go out find some people that love you and then go back and change the people's minds that need it the most mm -hmm. and maybe it's not you maybe it's really an emotional bad place for you to be but maybe there's a counselor maybe there's um someone that's an activist like me that would be willing to speak who's not emotionally scarred by your parents words they're like we have to work hard to make change and i think that social media has gotten to the point where people think that their posts mean something um i think that Yes, it's good to be vocal and share that type of stuff, but we have to... It doesn't to always translate to real, real life change.
Yeah. Yeah. Just like a vote isn't the same as a Facebook post. Like, if you don't vote this year, then your Facebook posts mean nothing. Everything you've ever posted is just a bunch of screaming and yelling that has done nothing. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, especially in that case. Um, if you're, <laughs> yeah. If you're having opinions on policies and, and the way that the country is running or, or being I managed, say, I guess. I always <laughs> just like ask, like, how is your post changing someone's mind? And mm -hmm. a lot of people's posts aren't meant to change people's minds. I even had someone post something and they're like, I'm excited uh, to see how many Republicans I can piss off. And I'm like, wow. Mm -hmm you do realize that those pissed off Republicans are probably going to go out and attack some Democrats because they feel like they've been wronged. And I was like, they're probably going to find some smaller people who aren't uh, confident, who aren't going to be able to defend themselves. And it's not a good uh, cycle to begin. Like, if you want to post something, like, I would say, say it like, oh, I really hope that this opens some Republicans' minds to this perspective. Like, if your posts are meant to anger someone and divide us more, it's not causing change. You are just causing divide. Right. right. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, um, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head. So, like, I mean, there's a lot of people who look at my posts and say, like, oh, well why don't you screenshot these comments that people are um, saying on your stuff and post it so people can like defend you and go and message them. And I'm like, because you guys want me to do that to like spread more like negative hate. Like I would rather delete the comment. I will private message this person and I will say something in hopes to change their mind. If not, then I just let it go. Like I'm not interested in causing any more yeah negative cycles that are going on yeah I, I think um the way again how much media we're consuming whether it's through social media or um news outlets or you know sometimes these are blogs or vlogs or whatever it is that are uh you know in it for likes in it for uh uh clicks and that can really cause like the most dramatic headlines, right? So then you have people just clicking on these things. And, and then next thing you know, you're four articles in or you're 18 YouTube videos in and you're, you know, starting to believe or starting to uh, see this perspective that um, I, I don't think is always the most, <laughs> peer reviewed or uh maybe makes the most logical sense like i think people have really um fallen into some dark internet voids <laughs> yeah and i mean you see like people using fear to draw um people's support like i personally have noticed that even the human rights campaign that i've always been a very big supporter of I've been getting their messages, their emails, their texts, their mail that they send me with the equality stickers. Mm -hmm. They, it's almost like they're not giving me anything constructive or any type of movement to stand behind. They send me this long letter of telling me what the world is going to be like once Trump rules the world. And I'm mm -hmm. just, they like sent like Trump is doing this, 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 and this. I'm like, okay, well, what are we doing? <laughs> Like, mm. what, what message are you putting across? Like, what, what are my donations going towards? You're not telling me any of this. You're just telling me my donations are going to go against Trump. And, like, I sent a, like, message back to their headquarters. And I was just like, hey, like, maybe your next, like, magazine that you send out in the mail, like, starts telling the communities the things that they can do in their local towns to make positive change for our community. Like, get some LGBT people on the school boards, get, cause teachers, there's tons of teachers that want to make those changes, but the mm -hmm. school boards say no. There's tons of councils that say that too. Yeah. I, I think what you're saying is we need an actual gay agenda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that we need to be making those types of things instead of, cause I mean, we saw how 
Trump used his fear to get people to vote for him. He was like, oh, the Democrats are giving all the jobs to the Mexicans and that we've got to build a wall because we've got to protect our jobs from Mexico. And he, he did exactly what the human rights and other people are trying to do. But that side, it's a different side. <laughs> like it's, they're fighting for like their white privilege. They want to keep that. That's what they're fighting for. Yeah, uh, Wh whether, whether that's fully understood and fully realized or not sometimes, you know, I feel like so often uh, because people don't understand white privilege or are willing to accept it in any way, uh, they often are so adamantly against the idea that they would even have that and they just want a, most of the time it's, it's uh, not ill willed, right? It's just like, well, I, you know, I have family members that are like, I, you know, don't see color or everything, you know, like everyone should just be equal and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, but they're not like that. <laughs> or, or even the concept of all lives matter versus black lives matter. Like, of course, all lives matter. That's why, but we're not acting like that. So that's why we need to specify and say, hello, black lives, black lives matter. And you need to pay attention to that. And I think so many people struggle with that because they're like, well, what about me? I'm like, Mary, this isn't about you. Okay. <laughs> like, just sit down. Nobody's, to, you know, it's, it's yeah. so interesting to me that it's really, uh, it feels like a lack of um, empathy. It really does. This, this real lack of uh, being able to see a, uh, another um, person, whether it's, uh, a different race or a different, um, you know, sexuality or gender, or even someone who views gender in a different way than you. Like, it, it's so, it, it's so interesting to me um, that these expression, these, these, these types of expressions always have to collide, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I've, talked to a lot of people who are Republican and I at, like I try to flip it around and I just like ask because they're so they're so quick to say one thing about something that really doesn't impact them at all um, I've always been the type of person that I try to think about the people who are being impacted by the decision that I'm discussing so like when it comes to abortion like it's not really my place um, so therefore I'm giving that power to the person that's going to impact the women in that situation. You mm -hmm. can talk about the children, but like at that point, I feel like a lot of people who argue that once again, when it came to the children being taken away from their parents at the border, when it came to LGBT people, I don't enjoy having those conversations because I feel like a lot of people it's just like they are making decisions based around things that aren't impacting them at all. And they're so strong to like make a hard standpoint on one decision. I'm like, at this point I'm giving it to like, it's not my decision. I'm never going to be pregnant. Uh, so therefore my decision is to say whatever the women over here are saying, that's what I think is, those are the people who should be saying what is happening there when it comes yeah, to. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that, again, goes to uh, this sense of disconnect when we're talking about the leaders that run the country and the people that live in the country. <laughs> you know, I think uh, it, it just seems so, um, it's so imbalanced. I yeah. think you have this sort of new progressive minded uh, couple generations and they're still sort of having to live in this like restrained world <laughs> in a lot of ways. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people, it's just so, it's so self-centered when it comes to the thought process of things. And when it comes to like LGBT rights, I'm just like, how is this impacting you exactly? Um, when it comes to like affirmative oh, yeah. action stuff, 
the uh, amount of I've, energy that you're putting into, you know, hating or like standing up against something uh, that is about like <laughs> love, <laughs> basically, it's, it's so crazy to me that people put so much energy into negativity when they could be harnessing that for uh, such, such a positive, uh, I, I mean, they could just be harnessed, harnessing it for positivity in so many ways, but instead they're choosing to hate on people. It's sad. Yeah, I, like there's definitely been people who are just like, when it comes to this election, there's the right candidate and then there's the wrong candidate. And in my mind, I say, yeah, that makes sense to me. Uh, but when it comes to having that conversation, I can't tell that to a Republican. I can't say, hey, Trump supporter, you're on the wrong side. Uh, mm -hmm. So that requires me to take a step back and say, okay, let's educate myself on this person. What is their job? What is their family? What, what impacts are, is COVID having on them? And mm -hmm. asking those types of things, because then at that point, I can form a argument for why Biden would be a better choice for the world, for the country. And I don't think that people are taking any time in that sense. Uh, I definitely am not a person who thinks that any Trump supporter should be voting for Trump this year. Uh, I think he's made enough statements in the past four years, his entire life, that makes it very clear. I tried reading his book uh, to kind of gain perspective because I was like, okay, he can't be completely horrible. And I had to put it down because it's such a self-centered, um, self-serving mindset that I couldn't even relate in the slightest. And there are some people, like I said, I cannot- are you, Were you I surprised? <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, every single time I try to give him the benefit of the doubt, when I see people sharing things online about things he said on Twitter, I was like, there's no way he said that. And I would check Twitter just to make sure. And I was just like, and he oh kept proving you're wrong. <laughs> I was like, he <laughs> did actually say it. So for me, like, yes, uh, that's how I feel. I think Trump's not a great person. He shouldn't be president. But uh, I have to understand why other people do think that way. Because these debates that have been going on, every single time I see the Democrats, they're like, Biden killed it. He was awesome. He showed Trump. And then right on the other side, I see all the people, they're like, Trump's amazing. He showed Biden. He is so great. I'm like, how? Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm not seeing it. But yeah. like, you have to take that time to understand because otherwise it's it doesn't matter. Like we We have to find ways to bring people over to our side because if we don't we're going to continue to be divided if we don't yeah i mean even more so i would say like rather than bring them over to our side just try to understand on a larger level in general whether that is relating to someone who doesn't look like you or speak like you or whatever it might be um, but I mean, literally, we're all on this planet as human beings. And we're trying to I mean, we could be solving so many more problems, if we weren't doing this bullshit, you know, like, let, let's talk about real issues. Let's um, I, I don't want to be like watching this clown on television. That's not productive for me. That's not productive for the country. That is simply a waste of everyone's time. And we could be doing so many better and bigger things. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to, like, relationships with other countries, when it comes to climate control, when it comes to, like, there are some things where it's just like, how about um, human rights, everyone's equal, like, it, treat everyone fairly, like, and be aware that people are different and don't assume you have to change them. Like, create communities that reflect, like, the community that it serves, like, I mean, you're talking about our presidents currently. I mean, even within our own communities, there's a lot of people who, it doesn't reflect the percentage of people within the community. Like my company, we just got contracted by the government for um, providing service to them now. And my company didn't have affirmative action built into the company. Mm -hmm. And just working, because 
I'm part of the team that's working on that, being a part of the HR team. And it's very interesting to see how important affirmative action is. It's there to create a company that reflects the community that it serves. And it's like, if 20% of your community is of the Latino community, then 20% of your company's employees should reflect that because that's what equality looks like. It's not mm -hmm. 50% white, 50% black. It's, it's, it's representative. It's different. So if our country, like when it comes to the amount of people in our country, it needs to be reflective of the people ruling the country because then decisions are going to be made that are fair to the representation of our country. And we just have to find ways to communicate that that will help other people to see it because yeah. and if also i think inspire people to um inspire more people of color and queer people and minorities in general to take um leadership roles and find ways to be involved and uh make real change you know L like we said there's so much just shouting into the void or posting things. Um, there are bigger and better ways to get involved in um, your community. And that's one thing that I've learned in community health is the uh, community infrastructures that exist and how much even I was sort of uh, missing out on when it came to um, sort of LGBT communities and, and uh, organizations uh, and the amount of things that I could be getting involved in and, and haven't been. So I think I encourage everyone to get involved in whatever way that they can and, and uh, any way that they can find, because that's how we change this stuff. <laughs> I feel like people, like I've heard a lot of people say things, uh, I don't see a lot of people doing things. Um, I think a lot of people point the finger, well, they need to make the change. They, I'm like, okay, you can make the change. One thing that I learned uh, is like when s cities are deciding whether or not, like, cause when people open businesses, they have to get it approved. And when it comes to LGBT bars and LGBT cafes and anything that's opening, they have to be approved by the community that they're being proposed in. And a lot of people don't realize that those things are voted down most of the time, like mm -hmm. LGBT things, uh, funding for school after school activities and stuff get voted down all the time. And it requires people to kind of start taking notice of that. So instead of focusing on certain things that you can't control, focusing on things that, literally like you were saying watching the clown on tv um it everything happens from like a very small level where we all have control over it and when it comes to like things being changed it does require the younger generation to actually go out and say i'm going to join my my district's like council and i'm going to make positive changes it's and even even on a uh you know, smaller, more personal level, like, look at our own, you know, look at each of um, our own sort of individual personal circles. And uh, are we surrounding ourselves with only those that have the same education, the same background, the same color, the same language, like, I have always been a like huge, huge proponent of making sure that my group of friends and um, my support system has always been very diverse in, um, you know, where they come from, what they believe, like, because it only teaches me and um, makes me reflect on my own views on whatever that might be or my own perception of the world because then I'm constantly interfacing with this person who uh, makes me think a different way. That's, that's like my um, biggest sort of ask when um, I, I'm creating friendships. It's, does this person teach me something or make me think a different way? Yeah, 
I mean, when you come in contact with people who think differently than you, that requires you to take that moment and ask why they think differently than you and educate mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, cause it's not, I mean, the unknown is scary, uh, but it's the unknown will always exist and getting yourself to the correct mindset of thinking the unknown is good. The unknown is potential for amazing growth. Mm -hmm. And like you're saying, like when you meet new people, I always say they unlock a world within you that you never knew existed until they mm -hmm. came into your life. Because like I said, every client that I've worked with, I tell them, I'm like, go out and meet new people. That's, and they're like, stop acting like that's um, the simple solution. I'm like, no, you're saying that you feel like there's no more options in your life. You've used all the resources that the current people in your life have. You need more people in your life. And I said, find people that you wouldn't normally hang out with. Find people that aren't part of your cloud that don't think the same way that you do. And instead of rejecting that difference, like try to interpret it and understand it and broaden the view that you have of the world because. Yeah, 100%, 100%. I, I think it not only makes you think in a different way, but it really broadens the amount of um, different perceptions that you take into account when you, when you wake up every day. You know, um, yeah. somebody mentioned age differences as well. I think age difference, color difference, language difference, like you need all of these different worldviews in order to create your own because otherwise you don't, ha you have a minimal library of um, ideas and, and perceptions um, that you're working with. So you can only have such a limited worldview if you're not, you know, expanding your relationships to people with other views and other worldviews. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, if you think about it, like when it comes to like the towns and stuff that a lot of people grow up in, you have every single person on this planet is given a certain environment that they grow up in. And every single person needs to understand that we are shaped by the environment around us. Mm -hmm. And if we don't actively put new things into our environment to grow, we will continue to be that endless cycle of people. Like I've lived in seven different states and came back to Virginia and there's people that have never left. And it's hard for me to communicate with them because I'm used to communicating with people who have been different places. And for me, trying to get people who have never left to understand that concept is really hard. It's almost like we have to start teaching the world to understand different isn't bad. Difference mm -hmm. is new opportunities that like, I personally think hiring people from other companies to join your company is really important too, because maybe like if you take cell phone companies, Verizon, Sprint, AT&T, T-Mobile, mm -hmm. like if you hire someone from another company, they'll be like, well, our company doesn't do it that way. Um, you want to listen to those new things because that's how you grow. You can't think, oh, different company, bad, wrong. I don't want to hear any of their ideas. Like yeah. your company yeah. can, because if your employees only work in one field for the rest of their life, there's no new to bring to the company. And that's how you grow. That's how like you survive. Yeah, exactly. One thing we uh, talk about in the work I do is the word diversity and what it really means. And I mean, it actually means the, you know, inner, inner exchange of novel ideas. That is what diversity really is. It's not necessarily um, just representation, but also dialogue and real interface between different, um, different worldviews and different, uh, you know, points of view intersecting. Yeah, you can't have an environment where you invite different people in but make it to where their voice is silenced that uh, I saw I went Completely to a diversity training and they showed a picture of like a bunch of sheep that were painted different colors and they're like this is what a lot of companies call diversity and then they showed like a picture of a rainforest with thousands of different animals all mm -hmm. over the forest and they're like this is what diversity is and this is an ecosystem that will survive yeah. this little herd of sheep that are painted different colors 
all think the same and are so stuck in like the mind of stupidity. And yeah, I like that. So a lot of people are just confused. They think that this herd of sheep that are painted different colors is a d diverse place but it really shows no diversity at all. I love that. <laughs> you can use it. Take yeah, it. I, I was going to say, I wonder if I can find this graphic online. <laughs> <laughs> I can send it to you. I've got the PowerPoint still. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I see that we've passed the six, <laughs> the six o'clock mark. We're 15 minutes past. Uh, is there anything that you would kind of like to throw out there just as like a last tidbit? before we end the call? Yeah, I mean, uh, just two things. One, uh, vote. Everyone should vote. Um, check your, you know, local uh, board of elections and make sure you're getting your information from them or from a trusted resource. There's a lot of disinformation that we're hearing about. So uh, I just want to make sure that everyone is um, consuming um, truthful and uh, authentic information. So make sure you go to the source. And um, secondly, just because uh, I have a little bit of a platform here, I want to make sure everyone uh, gets and keeps a medical home um, or a primary care physician of some kind because it's so important to get cancer screenings. It's what I do and it's uh, it's vital that you have a, res a resource that's able to tell you when to get cancer screenings and watch for any symptoms and signs. Um, yeah, it it's just super important to make sure you have some kind of medical home that can point you to those resources when and if you need them. Yeah, most definitely. I think that in our current situation with healthcare and all of that fun stuff, like there's a lot of people who don't go until the, like the worst happens and yeah, a lot of times the screenings and stuff will catch it and it is a lot cheaper to get those screenings done, especially if there's history within your family. And unfortunately for me, like both sides of my family have very strong histories in cancer. So that's something that I've always been on top of because I mean, that's something that you don't want to find out too late. And I definitely hundred percent late stage diagnosis is the number one enemy when it comes to um, cancer prevention. So Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you for doing this with me. Um, we've probably been social media friends for several years now. Yeah, um, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely appreciate doing this with you. Um, hopefully a lot of people gained a lot of insight from this conversation. Uh, maybe we can do it again some point. I've been, I've been trying to get people on the list. I've got a calendar to, I've got November filled up already, which is good. Good, thing. good. Well, yeah, I love tuning in and watching. So um i'm happy to do it it was great to talk to you awesome well i will let you go have a good evening i'm gonna make my hour commute home <laughs> all right have a good one